All right, so we're going to get started. So good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Clausen with the Niagara on the Lake Museum, and welcome to the next talk in our weekly virtual lecture series. Uh, as always, we're recording today's lecture, so if for some reason you um, have to leave or get kicked out or you weren't able to sign on, uh, you'll get the recording after the session, uh, you'll get it tomorrow, and we'll also be posting it on our YouTube channel, and we'll be sending it out on weekly e-blast as well. So um, there's lots of ways to watch this presentation afterwards. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation or any comments, uh, feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A, and uh, I'll field those to Ted at the end of the lecture. And as usual, if you'd like to support any of our programs here at the museum, like our lecture series, uh, you can make a donation through the link that I put in the chat box as well. So today we have with us Ted Rumble. Uh, to talk about some of the updates to the Ordnance Boundary Stones project that he's been working on and some planned restorations to one of the stones this year. Um, Ted's a retired orthopedic surgeon who has a long-standing interest in history, especially military history. And he's the former board member of the museum and he runs our FNI program here. Um, and he's done extensive research on the original Boundary Stones, Ordnance Boundary Stones, which can be found throughout town. Since his first presentation in 2020 on the subject, he's uncovered more stones, um, and brought their preservation uh, to the attention of the town and a lot of people in the community. So we're happy to have you again, Ted, to talk about this project because there's uh, tons of interest in it. And uh, we'd like to hear your updates and what's been going on. And just unmute yourself. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, by now, many of you have heard of the Ordnance Boundary Stones of Niagara Lake, which are unique historic artifacts in the old town. I last presented the story of these stones to the museum in 2020. Since then, progress has been made towards the restoration and protection of these stones. Today's talk is mainly to bring people up to date. For those who may not be familiar with them, I would like to begin with a review of the story of the Ordnance Boundary Stones and tell you about how they contributed to the development of our town. This map of the town of Niagara, as it was called then, was published in 1823, eight years after the end of the War of 1812, when the Americans invaded the Niagara River is at the bottom left, and Lake Ontario is at the bottom right. The town of Niagara had already been laid out within what was called the town plot. There were two parcels of land reserved for the military. In blue on the left, we have the Garrison Military Reserve, including Fort George, we know this today as the commons. And in green, at the bottom, we have the Mississauga Reserve, as it was called then, which we know today as Queen's Royal Park and the golf course. It includes Fort Mississauga. But note that the Mississauga Reserve does not include the entire golf course, Half of it is still in private hands. And that half includes a critical length of shoreline adjacent to Fort Mississauga and facing the river and the American Fort Niagara across the river, which was seen as a threat. On May 27, 1813, American soldiers came across the river and landed on our shores occupied the town and Fort George, and drove the British army out. The Battle of Fort George was a humiliating defeat for the British, and they wanted to control the entire shoreline to prevent another American landing. They also wanted a minimum 800 yards clear field of fire for the cannons in Fort Mississauga. That shoreline was owned by a wealthy businessman and investor named James 
Crooks, a fascinating character in the early days of our town. Mr. Crooks was a canny Scot and a tough negotiator. He demanded a huge concession of Crown land on the garrison reserve consisting of two plots. The upper yellow square is today the block bounded by King, Picton, Wellington, and Castlereagh Streets. The Prince of Wales Hotel and the Niagara-on-the-Lake Museum are within this plot. The lower yellow shape consists of lots adjacent to Fort George extending to the water where he wanted to put a wharf near today's Navy Hall. The earliest reference to the stones in this letter was written by E.W. Durnford, the commanding officer of the British Army Royal Engineers in Canada. This is a transcript. Durnford considers it, quote, desirable for government to cause the necessary steps to be taken for making the exchange alluded to without delay, unquote. So it authorizes the great swap with James Crooks. He also orders the installation of, quote, regular boundary posts, unquote, to define the boundary of the military reserves. This is the earliest reference to the ordnance boundary stones. Note the date at the top, June 1823, over two centuries ago. The boundary posts he's referring to are called ordnance boundary stones. They are made of white limestone from the Queenston Quarry, which is still in operation today. They are nine inches square, about a foot above the ground, with the initials B-O and an arrow engraved on the front. B-O stands for the Board of Ordnance, which was the custodian of military property of the British government from 1687 to 1855. It was the second biggest department of the British government after the treasury. It was very powerful. The arrow is the broad arrow, which was the symbol used by the Board of Ordnance to identify military property of the British government. There were severe penalties for anyone interfering with any property marked with the broad arrow. Ordnance boundary stones were placed around the perimeter of the four military properties to protect them from encroachment from the town. This map of the town of Niagara was published by the Board of Ordnance in 1853. It shows the military reserves in the town as well as the original location of the stones. In blue on the left is the garrison reserve, which we know as the commons today, with Fort George at the bottom. In green at the bottom right is the Mississauga reserve, including land received from James Crooks in the Great Swap, which we know as the golf course and Queens Royal Park today. Fort Mississauga is at the bottom. Back in the 1820s, it was spelled Mississauga, named after Mississauga Point, which is why the reserve is properly called the Mississauga Reserve. Today, we spell it Mississauga. This is why the street leading into the old town is named Mississauga Street. The spelling on the sign is historically correct. In his wonderful book on common ground, Richard Merritt writes, had it not been designated as a military reserve, the crooks portion of the point would probably have been developed and the unique and arguably most historic golf course 
in Canada would not exist today. And that's the main point, isn't it? The military reserves, demarcated by the ordnance boundary stones marked with the broad arrow, helped protect our green spaces from development as the town grew. The red square here is Simcoe Park, which was also military land. Once the Board of Ordnance had ceded land to the Anglican Church, and then to the Roman Catholic Church, and finally to James Crooks, it left Simcoe Park as an island of military property in the middle of the town. The orange square to the right is the hospital block, which was the final military property obtained by the Board of Ordnance. It is bounded by Queen, Dorchester, Johnston, and Nassau streets. So those are the four military properties in town. Ordnance boundary stones were placed around the perimeter of all of them. How many stones are there? Originally, there were 37. Today, 19 can still be found in our town. This is the most of any town in the world. The circles here represent the 37 ordnance boundary stones in town. The circles in red are the 19 stones that can still be seen today. The circles in blue are the stones that are missing or have sunken underground. I'd like to show you a few of these stones to give you a better understanding of what we're talking about here. At the bottom of this picture, is Ordnance Boundary Stone 26. It is found at the inner corner of the Charles Inn property. The Charles Inn can just be seen through the trees at the top. This stone is best seen from the ninth tee of the golf course. This is the best preserved stone in town with the engraving and the beveling clearly seen and it's at the right height above the ground. This is boundary stone four. When they built the wall around the Rand estate, they didn't disturb the stone, they built on top of it. It took me a long time to find a stone in a stone wall. Can you see it? It's right here. This stone was placed in 1823, and the wall was built on top of it in the early 1900s. There's no engraving because we're looking at the side of the stone. But what's going on here? Why does the wall extend beyond the stone, which marks the boundary of military land? This 1852 map of the Garrison Reserve or the Commons explains how this came about. If you look at the very top of the map, you will see the boundary as a solid line. Inside the boundary is a dotted line. This was known as the carriage track, where military officers would drive around the perimeter of the reserve. Top right here is John Street, which ended at King Street. The carriage track became an extension of John Street. So Rand built his wall right down to John Street, meaning he built on military land. And that's why Ordnance Boundary Stone 4 is found in the Rand Estate Wall today. This was contested by the federal government and an amicable settlement was reached in 1960. And that's why John Street became John Street West and the carriage track became John Street East. In fact, John Street at the bottom here is the only street in the Heritage District that does not change its name when it crosses King Street. Gage Street becomes Castlereagh, Johnson becomes Platoff, 
Queen becomes Picton, Predo becomes Byron, and Front becomes Ricardo. But I digress. At the bottom of this picture is Boundary Stone 5, which is located near John Street, close to the entrance to the Heritage Trail, which was railway land. This stone was placed here to mark the boundary between the railway land and the garrison reserve, which we know as the commons today. You can see the pillar and post in the distance. This 1910 map shows the railway curving away from King Street. Ordnance Boundary Stone 5 marks the boundary between the garrison reserve and the land given to the Erie and Ontario Railway. <laughs> boundary Stone 31 is located across the street from the Prince of Wales Hotel at the entrance to Simcoe Park, which was also once military land. On the left is a bench, beside the bench is a stone. The engraving can still be seen, though the stone has sunk down quite far. At the top left of this picture is Fort Niagara, on the American side of the river. On May 27, 1813, American soldiers from Fort Niagara launched the Battle of Fort George and captured our town. Once the British reoccupied the town, they were determined to control the entire shoreline facing Fort Niagara. This is why Boundary Stone 22 was placed here in 1823. It is in the bottom right of this picture beside the golf cart path today. It's sunken halfway into the ground, but the engraving can still be seen. The hospital block is bounded by Queen, Dorchester, Johnson, and Nassau streets. <clears throat> At one time, the town owned it and planned to build a hospital, but they changed their minds. The town wants to set up an outdoor market behind the courthouse where the parking lot is today, but that was military land. So the town traded the hospital block to the Board of Ordnance in exchange for the half block behind the courthouse. And that's why the street behind the courthouse running from Balzac's Coffee to the Angel Inn is called Market Street today. In 1854, the Royal Engineers installed ordnance boundary stones on all four corners of the hospital block. In the bottom right, on the corner of Queen and Nassau Streets, ordnance boundary stone 36 can still be seen today. It's at the right height out of the ground and in very good shape. It shows the white color of the original limestone. They will all look more like this once they are restored and cleaned. I presented here only a brief synopsis of the story of the ordnance boundary stones. You may wish to watch my previous presentation, which gives a more complete history of the stones and shows all the stones discovered to that point. Just go to YouTube and search on ordnance boundary stones and it will come up. Since my last presentation four years ago, there have been several significant developments in the story of the Ordnance Boundary Stones of Niagara-on-the-Lake. First, three more stones have been dis discovered. Secondly, the Municipal Heritage Committee became interested in the stones, and then the Town Council supported restoration of the stones, starting with OBS 32, as a pilot project. So first, I'd like to show you the three stones that have been found since I last presented to you. We knew from the 1853 map that OBS-1 was located near the river bank, which is the red circle on the left of the map. We tramped up and down through the underbrush many times, but could never find it. In 2022, 
Richard LaRock of the LaRock Group Surveyors found it about six inches underground. No wonder we couldn't see it. It's amazing what professional surveyors can find. It's at the bottom of this picture with the walking path and the river in the distance. This stone marks the southern boundary of the Garrison Reserve or the Commons today. The Charles Inn was once called the Lockhart Hotel. Its property was never part of the Mississauga Reserve, the golf course today, which is why it had three boundary stones around it. Boundary Stone 25 marks the boundary line at Simcoe Street. This picture shows the boundary line of the Charles Inn property on Simcoe Street. The J.D. Barnes Surveying Company located Boundary Stone 25, which was also six inches underground. Ordnance Boundary Stone 34 at the corner of Dorchester and Johnson Streets, the top left here, was a hard one to find. We hunted around for years, but never found it. So one day I knocked on the homeowner's door and he said, I know where it is. And there it was, buried in his garden. So now we found ordnance boundary stones on all four corners of the hospital block. Next, members of the Municipal Heritage Committee took an interest and asked me to show them some of the stones. Once they realized the historic importance of these stones, they passed a motion recommending to town council that restoration of the stones begins with a pilot project to fully restore Boundary Stone 32, along with a commemorative plaque. Early this year, the town council approved the motion from the Municipal Heritage Committee and committed funds for the restoration of OBS 32. At the bottom of this picture is Ordnance Boundary Stone 32. It has sunk down almost flush with the ground. King Street is on the upper right, looking towards Queen Street. It was a hard stone to find as it was covered in mulch most of the year. This stone is on town property and was selected by the Municipal Heritage Committee to be the first stone restored. It's located in Semco Park at the corner of King and Byron Streets at the bottom right on the map. The project plan for Ordnance Boundary Stone 32 is in three parts, restoration, protection, and celebration. Alex Topps is a landscape architect who lives in town who has volunteered to help with the restoration of the stones. He did this drawing to explain how to reset the stones so they don't sink again over the next 200 years. Restoration requires excavation of the stone, preparation of the hole, placing a precast concrete slab, resetting the stone at the correct height, and backfilling to keep it in place. We are currently in discussions with the monument restoration experts who rout routinely do this type of work in cemeteries. Protection of the stone involves installation of a metal barrier around it similar to this, which will not only protect the stone from future damage, but will also frame it. Celebration of the story of the stones involves a commemorative plaque and a web page. A commemorative plaque will be installed near OBS 32, explaining the historic significance of the military reserves in the development of our town. On the right of this picture is the one ordnance boundary stone found in London, Ontario in Piccadilly Park. For this one stone, they erected a commemorative plaque similar to what we envision for OBS 32. 
In addition, a small metal sign beside each stone will identify which one it is, similar to those used in a botanical garden. A QR code will allow visitors to click with their cell phone and go straight to the museum's web page, giving more detailed information. You can check it out today. Just go to notlmuseum.ca, click on Research and Ordnance Boundary Stones. Many people are contributing to this project to restore the stones. Shauna and Amy at the museum have been very helpful with the research and the development of the web page. Samrazia is the current town heritage planner who will move this project forward. Alex Tops is a landscape architect who lives in town. He has volunteered to help plan the, re the resetting of the stones. Richard LaRocque is an Ontario land surveyor who also lives in town. He has volunteered his time and expertise. An ordinance boundary stone is a legal survey marker and cannot be disturbed except under supervision of an Ontario land surveyor. Frank Racciopo owns the Queenston Quarry from which the original stones have come. He has volunteered to make duplicate stones identical to the originals from the same quarry to replace missing stones. Cosmo Condina is a professional photographer who has made high resolution photographs of all the stones found so far, along with geotagging. David Snellgrove is a member of the Municipal Heritage Committee who has helped move this project forward with the town. We are also in discussions with a monument restoration company and a custom welder to restore the stones and to make a barrier and commemorative plaque planned for this spring. The experience gained in the restoration of Ordnance Boundary Stone 32 will inform the town with respect to the restoration of the remainder of the stones. The town is planning work on two or three stones each year until they are all restored and protected. The Ordnance Boundary Stones of Niagara-on-the-Lake are unique and authentic historical artifacts, which explain how our town came to be the way it is today, with beautiful green spaces, including Simcoe Park, Queen's Royal Park, the golf course, and the commons. It's time they were restored, protected, and celebrated. We look forward to an exciting project to restore Ordnance Boundary Stone 32 this spring for the enjoyment and education of residents and visitors to our town for the next 200 years. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ted. We do have some questions here. So Debbie Sweetman uh, asked, were the stones that were found by the surveyors found incidentally to a survey or were the surveyors retained to help locate the stones? So the stone that was found by the Laroque group uh, was found because uh, Richard Laroque went looking for it. And he has access to surveyors notes and detailed information. He was able to locate the stone even though it was underground. The uh, Ordnance Boundary Stone 25 was found by the J.D. Barnes Surveying Company in the course of doing a survey of the golf course. And um, as to the stones that are underground, do you think that we'll be able to discover any more in kind of future surveys or? You know, I think it's possible we may find one or two more. Uh, surveyors, as we know, uh, have a, an amazing ability to locate these stones underground. Uh, you often wonder if ground penetrating, penetrating radar might also find a couple uh, of stones. Now, some of them we know have been removed, but there may be one or two which are still underground. Um, Gail Benjafield was just sharing that um, 
she is related to uh, James Crook's family. So her sister-in-law, uh, Sue Crooks Benjafield is a direct descendant and um, she has some original Crooks stuff and they've also given uh, the museum some Crooks material, like a teapot that was buried in 902 or in um, Niagara on the Lake when the town was burnt. Um, and so she's just proud of her connection. So she was sharing that. And, and Gail, uh, your second question about the recording, it will be made available. So you'll receive that and you can pass it along to your family. Um, and Sandra Lawrence uh, wanted to know, did you consult at all with Willow Bank about the restoration of the stones through any of this? Uh, we have not. Um, we have spoken to people who have served on the board of Willow Bank uh, and who have expertise in restoration and cleaning of these stones. So there are people from Willow Bank who are involved. Um, Linda Fritz wondered if you could give us a bit of info about the Queenston stones. So Queenston also had a military reserve with, uh, I believe, 15 stones originally placed around it. And these have been researched by Betsy Masson. Uh, but only uh, one, two, I think three of them have been found so far. Uh, they don't have the same story, uh, perhaps, that the, uh, the stones have in the old town because... Uh, the town didn't grow up around the military reserves in the same way it did in the old town. Uh, Craig Tallman says uh, he believes they might have at least one OBS in Grimsby on the west side of Kerman Avenue between Highway 8 and Livingston Avenue. Is it worth expanding this work to other historic towns in Niagara? Oh, I think it's uh, worthwhile finding all the boundary stones you can because they tell the story of how a place developed, you know, um, and the boundary stones were placed by the uh, Royal Engineers around the world. Uh, so there are many places that have one or two, but there's no place in the world that has 19 still in place. Um, Gwen Lang is asking why the names change from east to west as you go up King Street. So here's the problem. Uh, originally, all the streets ended at King Street, and uh, when you went the other side of King Street, you are now on military land. So that meant that the uh, properties were numbered starting from King Street uh, out. So Queen Street all the way along would be number one starting at King Street, and they would number them from there. So if you extended Queen Street, for example, what are you going to do uh, what about the numbers? You you can't renumber all the houses. The uh, post office would freak out, I'm sure. Um, and if you call it Queen Street East and Queen Street West, it's a bit awkward. I mean, are you going west on Queen Street East? <laughs> you know, so the simplest uh, solution to that was to uh, change the name of the street on the other side of King Street. So that preserved the numbering of the streets in the old town. That's that. I like that answer. There's there's always that old folklore answer of um, you aren't supposed to cross the king. And so that was <laughs> why. And I've heard a lot of people say that, but I like your answer better. It makes more sense to me. <laughs> um, Stuart Hall just mentioned there's 17 stones in Queenston and four have been found and they're they're looking for more still. So hopefully that project will also continue on. Um, oh, and, thank you, Stuart. I, I, there are four found. I mean, there's one more since I last heard, so I'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah, who's ever gathering information on the Queenston one, let us know, and uh, we would love to hopefully do a future presentation on Queenston, too. Oh, and uh, actually, Betsy Masson has just said there's actually 19 stones in Queenston. Um, okay. And she says three have been found. <laughs> so we'll let Stuart and Betsy duke it out as to how many have been found <laughs> <laughs> and how many there are. But uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see how uh, that project develops as, as people find more of those stones, hopefully. Um, and Maria Laws wanted to know uh, if you think there might be boundary stones in St. Catharines. Is there any military property um, that would make sense for St. Catharines? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. All right, I think that's it for our questions. So if anybody else has any questions, 
um, feel free to forward them on and I can uh, pass them along to Ted for you. Um, this is obviously a, a you know, ever expanding <laughs> project that Ted has going on and, and always looking for more stones and more information and hopefully more restoration um, after you finish the first one and uh, uh, that pilot project, hopefully more will continue after that. So um, yeah, feel free to send any more questions you guys might have, or if you want more information on the stones, as Ted mentioned, we do have uh, information on the museum. It's under the research tab on our uh, website at otlmuseum.ca. And uh, you can go under the uh, uh, Ordnance Boundary Stones um, uh, tab, I guess, uh, under research. And uh, all of the pictures that Cosmo has taken are there with information on the Ordnance Boundary Stones, um, on the, what, you know, what Board of Ordnance is, what Broad Arrow is, so all that information. And uh, you can also find Ted's first presentation on our YouTube channel as well. So thanks again, Ted, for joining us today. And thank you for every, everyone for watching today. Our next presentation is February 21st at 11 o'clock. And we have Josh Poole from the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center over in New, uh, New York State, who's going to present the borderland, black agency and resistance between two nations. So hopefully you'll join us next week. And thank you again for joining us today. Have a happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Amy. Bye-bye.